uh, we should get on with our next panel. So do we have to talk about the eSports evolution uh, our moderator, my colleague Ewan Morris. Well, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is only the second time I've hosted a panel, so excuse me if everything's a bit awkward. But oh. it's really not, the <laughs> focus really isn't on me. Good center one. <laughs> focus isn't on me. It's on uh, these three fine gentlemen here. Uh, yeah, as Dave said, we are missing one person. Uh, Nick mm. unfortunately got held up on his travel, so he won't be joining us today. But I think that just leaves more space for you guys to talk. So. Uh, I'm going to make sure I have my questions in front of me, and I think we can just start off if you guys can just introduce yourselves, starting with you, Chris. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm the uh, general manager of Dev Sisters Europe. Um, we do mobile games, um, mostly. Uh, however, we're looking into console and PC as well, and we're dabbling into a brawler that comes out next year. So uh, we're kind of interested on that side in esports in general, but um, I have to out myself. I'm basically here as a fanboy uh, and mostly a consumer of esports. Nice. Uh, my name is uh, Famer. I'm the head of growth at Jawakir. So we're the largest social gaming app in the MENA region, uh, based out of Jordan. And esports is one thing that we have been del uh, diving into. And we have been hosting actually esports tournaments lately uh, in card and board games like Domino's, Chess, Uno, which I can speak about in a bit. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mika. I'm the CEO of Ens Esports. And uh, I guess in this panel, I'm having a uh, a little bit different perspective because ENZ is a competitive uh, esports uh, company. So we have uh, players and teams, you know, fighting uh, against their uh, opponents in different games. And uh, currently, Counter Strike is our main focus, main product, if you will. And uh, our team is number two in the world in the world ranking. So we've been doing pretty well. Ooh. One more spot to go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, my my background is more from games and tech. Uh, uh, before I joined ENS about five years ago. Um, and I'm happy to obviously be here. Fantastic. Well, like I said, these are three very, very different perspectives, but I think they're all three very valuable perspectives because we, uh, we kind of spoke about the subject before, kind of going over the questions and everything, and there was some really fascinating insights. So I'm hoping we're not going to be missing anything. So just to kind of start off, a um, bit of an icebreaker, because you say, one key trend that you've noticed in eSports recently, each of you? Any takers? Me? Okay. Right. Um, what I like a lot, a trend, uh, I think the production value of eSports events online and uh, on-site is uh, extremely high and getting very high, getting much higher, um, very high production value and very high um, price money. Um, I think that's a trend that I noticed. Price money gets higher. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, mobile esports. I think that's an upcoming trend that we've been seeing growing at such a rapid pace. Uh, so that would be interesting to see kind of uh, how that compares with uh, PC and console games. But yeah, for me, it's mobile trend, uh, mobile esport games. Yeah, from my side, I mean, uh, take a little bit more negative spin to it. Um, it's been hard for. Um, Esports organizations who have competitive teams for the last year or so financially. Um, some people have used the term esports winter, which means that uh, there's a lot of teams struggling financially, um, burning tons of money, losing money, and not being able to find a viable business model to you know support their business. And uh, maybe kind of you know expanding that a little bit, like when you operate esports teams, you have players, professional gamers, um, you need to find business models outside that kind of competitive scene, right? Uh, price money is growing, that's great, there's more, more eyeballs to the, to the scene, price money actually goes ma mostly to the, to the players themselves, right? So, um, for example, ENS, we've set up a business which is more like a media business, right? So we have our, our professional players and, and, and streamers, content creators, which from our perspective, it's more like a, like a media that we try then to monetize together with port partners like you know, Red Bull or Logitech or you know, telecom operators, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, you know, it's more like an inventory, if you will, right? It's a, it's a little bit extreme to say that, but that's, that's how we, we kind of we kinda defined it in a way that we need to find this business models outside that competitive play, if you will, like leveraging that kind of visibility and reach towards fans. Um, and then kind of you know try to monetize it, it, it outside of that uh, 
and competitive gaming. We, we are one of the rare animals in this world of esports that we are actually bootstrapped, but we are also profitable. Most of the teams out there are currently bleeding money, or at least they were bleeding money a few months ago, and many of them have done like very, very you know, dramatic decisions in terms of downscaling while we've been actually growing nicely. So I guess we are in a happy place, but, uh, but it's, not, it's still a little bit kind of challenging in, in this kind of industry, if you would take the perspective from esports teams, how they uh, can kind of fund their business growth. Yeah, fantastic. I, I just kind of want to bring out one of the key points that I, all three of you mentioned, or at least I believe all three of you mentioned, which was uh, about prize money growing constantly. Because interestingly enough, if any of you are familiar with the Gamers 8 tournament that they hold uh, in Saudi Arabia, that's a uh, game is eight because it's eight weeks. It's not anything to do with the number of games or the number of competitors. But um, one of the things that I noticed, interestingly enough to connect this back to mobile, is that the second highest prize pool was actually for PUBG Mobile, beat out only by Dota, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, Chris. 15 million? The, 15, the yes. Month? Correct. Yeah. I was actually going to come back to you because you mentioned you are, a, uh, you are a Dota guy. I'm a Dota guy, yes. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but to kind of connect back to that, we've seen a bigger focus on mobile esports and on games on mobile that kind of follow that kind of trend. You know, shooters like Fortnite and PUBG, and even other games like Clash of Clans, kind of uh, in the uh, DreamHack series, those are kind of popping up. What do you think makes it an appealing platform for esports? Uh, I'm taking this again. Um, I think, so first of all, the ubiquity, meaning you always have the device with you, um, which makes it easy for you to consume, obviously, esports. You, you, they're right here. <laughs> they're right here. You, have, you carry them around. Um, and uh, you can consume it on there. But what's pretty sexy in that mix as well, I think, is because you can also play on it, right? So the, the entry barrier, so to say, to competitive esports for you on a mobile phone is pretty low. You download the game, um, and, and you can actually uh, be part of it, even more so than on a PC setup that, you know, if you play competitive yep. Dota or Counter-Strike, it has to be a pretty decent setup, right? And so ubiquity and, 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 and the entry barrier is quite low for, for mobile. Yeah. I think I agree with Chris on this. It's accessibility. You know, everyone has a smartphone nowadays, and uh, most smartphone holders do play games on there. So uh, can, you know, playing a game that is within the eSports uh, world, like PUBG, uh, I mean, anyone, can, anyone can join, can have an eSports tournament. Uh, with us, I mean, we see we saw what happened uh, with Joaker uh, in, in June. So we hosted kind of the first esports tournament in Iraq uh, for Dominoes, and we opened up only for Iraqi users. And we had around 150,000 people join and play in the event, mm -hmm. and those were their initial phases. And then, kind of the top 32 qualified to play offline uh, for to, for a chance to win a brand new car. Uh, so that was very interesting and awesome that we saw. I think accessibility is the biggest one. This is what makes it very big. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's mobile. It's it's all about the access, right? You know, there's 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 so like you know huge amount of people having, first of all, you know, affording a mobile phone, right? Uh, having access to it, right? Um, I think you know if I'm putting a, like our team is international, so Counter Strike team number two in the world. It's like they they are across Europe. The players are from different countries because that's how you build the the winning roster nowadays, right? But if, if we would be to look into mobile game, uh, building a competitive team, we couldn't do that in Finland. I mean, if we look into Europe, we probably go to. Um, Turkey might be interesting. You know, there's quite a lot of mobile gamers. There's, there's also like professional gamers. You know, there's starts to be the quality. I mean, Finland, yeah, we have some great people and great players, but you don't have the quantity to kind of, you know, eventually build up a roster because everybody has a PC. Everybody who's kind of taking it seriously as an eSport, they have a PC at home, right? Uh, great, you know, like a fiber connection, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of like, like, you, ha you need to look into certain markets. And obviously, you know, Southeast Asia, Asia, Middle East, all those are booming. And I, I don't see anything stopping the mobile gaming, right? It's only going to grow. Uh, but it's going to take a while before we see the uh, kind of, you know, you know, a lot of people playing mobile games competitively in, for example, in Northern Europe, Europe or Scandinavia. Uh, a small side note about Gamers 8, right? The price pools, mm. like, I mean, second best team in the world in Counter-Strike, obviously we had to lose the final, so we became second. We only lost to the best team in the world, right? But uh, the prize pool actually they match with the industry. So Counter-Strike prize pool was only a million bucks, but that's that's the, the million bucks is paid by the majors as well. 
and Dota 15 million is based on what Dota was giving out on DI last year. So that's how they kind of build up the prize pool. They could, I mean, I was obviously challenging a little bit, like, hey, you know, if you play 15 million for Dota, maybe Counter Strike should be like 10. Yeah, <laughs> didn't fly, but you know, that's how they kind of build up the the the, the kind of prize uh, money mechanism at the gamer side. I see what you mean. I don't so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a break, Chris, for this next question. You <laughs> sat you sat closest to the person who's talking, unfortunately, so I'm always going to default to you. But going back to you, Mika, you mentioned, obviously, the fact that there's a lot of growing markets that are adopting mobile primarily for their for their esports. You know, we see that in places like Southeast Asia, with games like Arena Free Fire, or uh, Riot, who took the reins on... Um, Ah, uh, Wild Rift, if I remember correctly. Yeah. That was a game that was previously managed by another company in terms of the esports in that area, if I'm remembering correctly. And Riot recently took the reins once more because the esports scene just wasn't really working for people and there was a lot of excitement there because people are invested in that esport and it just wasn't being managed right. But I'm going to be a little bit provocative now and I'm going to ask, do you think mobile is going to come to be a big competitor against PC directly? Is it going to be like a case of like... One is going to be on top. One's going to be kind of pushed down. I, I, th I think there's always going to be a place for, for a PC competitive side of games. Again, you look into the Counter Strikes and Valorants and 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 and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's, there's there's going to be a place. I mean, Counter Strike has been there for like what 20 plus years, right? So it's not going to go away in, a, in a, anytime soon. But I think um, I'm I'm seeing it more from the casual follower perspective that maybe mobile gets more kind of attention, if you will. Mm. Um, but at the same time, keeping in mind that the, the amount, of, amount of people just following esports is growing as well, right, as players. So I don't think there's going to be kind of uh, any cannibalism, if you will, right? Um, mobile, obviously, there's, there's kind of a lot more innovation happening, what, what comes to new games and, you know, you know stuff like that. So, so the, there's there's a kind of may, maybe there's a higher upside if you will, but I don't see PC gaming just you know going. Away. It's hard for me to see that in five years, you know, people for example in Northern Europe would kind of prefer mobile uh, esports titles over PCs. You know, to probably gain traction, but PC will be there at least for quite some time. That's my that's how I see it. Fair enough. Um, you guys did have anything to add on to that? I think uh, I agree 100 percent and in fact you know having uh, mobile e mobile esports uh, in correlation with PC and console, you have a broader range of audience mm. you have way more people competing within the esports industry and I think it's actually good uh, and especially at the rate that the esports industry is growing I mean there is always uh, you know, room for all types of players to join mm. uh, but as you mentioned you know PC gamers are always PC gamers you know they're uh, pretty intense and it's way more competitive than your casual mobile gamers so I don't think there will be any cannibalization between both because there's huge room for all yeah I mean this together sorry yeah, uh, Chris, anything you want to add? Yeah, um, um, the only thing to add, yeah, I think uh, they're not very much mutual ex exclusive, so you could easily do both. I also see mobile maybe as an entry to esports, right, and then uh, move on to PC and then consume or play both in parallel. Um, and then PC will always have a spot. Also, to correct me if I'm wrong, I think mobile is mainly single player, you know, by yourself. Also, it's pretty awkward to watch when they, like, you know, yeah. for an esports tournament, so it's much cooler, like in a big team there, you know, chatting with each other, and uh, yeah. so it's a different kind of a vibe and style. But yeah, again, I think uh, they're not mutually exclusive. But yeah. it's also, like, just one more thing. So, like, we did a research with our fan base, well, maybe two years ago, um, about their behavior when they're following our games. Like, Twitch is obviously the place where they go to check the games, and 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 and. Many of them then use a second screen to be in touch with their friends. Like you imagine going to a a football game, right, with your friends. You know, you you, you watch the game and you have a chit chat with your friends. Maybe you have a drink, but it's it's all about this common community or, or or group of friends. So a lot of esports fans do that online, right? Whether that's Discord, whether that's uh, even Slack, you know, WhatsApp. 
uh, but people basically, you know, have a have a larger screen, or big screen, basically for following the mats, mm. and then they have a second screen, whether that's mobile or or even a, like a PC and with a second monitor, and then they have their kind of con connect like connection with their friends, mm. talking about the game and all that stuff. So so we did that study. I don't I, I forgot the percentage, but there's actually a pretty high percentage of people who are actually not watching the game alone, if you will, right? Mm. You know, they are virtual with their friends. Uh, and that's probably, by the way, uh, an area where there would be room for uh, innovation as well to kind of, you know, build up this uh, this experiment, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I've been kind of firmly put in my place in regards to that with um, what I mentioned about, you know, mobile and PC competing. Because as you said, it's a massive market. It's only growing as well. So really, there's not much space to compete, you know. PC players are going to be PC players, mobile players are going to be mobile players, and in a lot of cases they are both. It's just a question of your preferred platform. So, I mean, when I'm talking about e when I'm thinking about esports and maybe, and maybe talking about esports, I think of the history of it of coming from kind of grassroots stuff. You know, like you LAN parties like on Unreal, or probably the one that I always think of is the Evo tournament. You know, fighting games and everything. If you want to talk about like communities, that's a major one. But we've also seen a lot of games that have been built to be esports ready and have had like official support. And in some cases, that hasn't always worked to their benefit, or maybe just hasn't helped to push them to that kind of like longevity. You know, the the, the example I think of um, the most is probably Overwatch. Um, you know, Blizzard in terms of esports. Obviously, StarCraft and everything, that's been a major thing. But, you know, they've also had Heroes of the Storm, which they pulled support from a couple of years after launch, if I remember correctly. Um, and Overwatch, they've recently had some issues with, you know, some of the teams basically complaining very loudly about the cost of franchising and falling viewership numbers. And this is in spite of and maybe because of um, official support. I mean, do you think that there needs to be more official support in that case? Or do you think it needs to kind of be a case of where they look for organic growth and look for the local scenes and look for the people who really want to get into that and then build up from there? Uh, I, I, I can go with that. So I think, I think grassroots, that's always needed, right? You know, to build the true kind of engagement and, and even the loyalty, if you will, within the, the gamers, right? But at the end of the day, if you think about like, what are these competitive teams from the game's publisher perspective, right? You know, ENS is a marketing tool mm. for Valve to market Counter-Strike, right? Building these kind of, uh, you know, um, superstars who people look up to and they want to kind of, you know, imitate in the game. Hey, this guy did a cool move, you know, I want to try it as well. These are influencers, right? And that's why, you know, we are kind of, you know, we're trying to use them as influencers towards other brands as well. But having said that, you know, we market basically games like Counter-Strike. So I think it's only justified if we do a job well that there's an incentive from the games publisher. Now, taking a little bit different kind of or taking a, a step back, I think, you know, when we do decisions in which games do we operate, a relationship or partnership with game publisher is extremely important, right? Um, I mentioned about financial struggles for majority of the teams in the industry right now. Is, I mean, that's partially based on the fact that a lot of these game publishers have cut down their, uh, their support a little bit, right? We did the dif difficult decision uh, at the end of last year, we dropped uh, our PUBG roster, PUBG PC roster. Mm -hmm. We were partners for PUBG uh, for like three or four years, right? And there were certain financial incentives included, which basically they asked us to commit, not only commit to the game, but committing to certain marketing activities, creating content for them, you know, uh, uh, you know promoting the game, all that stuff, right? Uh, which is basically a transaction, right? Then you try to build, I mean, with the help, their help, we're trying to build the best team in the world. I think best time we were probably ninth in the world kind of championships. Uh, but we had to cut it down because of the cost base didn't anymore make sense when PUBG decided that they're going to kind of decrease the amount of uh, support they're going to give. Like, like instead of having maybe uh, similar expectations as what we would need to deliver, but not necessarily having the financial incentive anymore. So we were like, okay, right, it's, it's going to be very difficult for us to kind of build it as, even as a break-even product, if you will, right? So this official support is, is, is extremely important for a lot of the 
lot of the competitive teams out there to basically justify the costs for building the infrastructure and you know practice rooms and game houses and having all the support staff around the the players and that that's the difference what we need if you want to build the best teams in the world rather than having you know a good team yeah i mean if i could just hold off and go a little bit off script for just a second just to get you to go over that point again. So you're basically saying that previously with PUBG you had a partnership where they had a financial incentive for you and for that you were on the hook for a lot of like what, what were you know like streaming yeah, collaborations you know like promoting of the game and everything. Yeah. Do you think that which I mean that must be very intimidating for a lot of smaller smaller yes. smaller groups. It's it's got to be like cuz it's a big commitment. It, it is. It is, and 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 and, and ob obviously it's a transaction. So if we would have not delivered what we were committing to, mm. then we would not get financial benefits out of it. Like it's, it's fair play, right? Like you need to deliver X, Y, Z. If you fail X, you know you're gonna get less incentive. So obviously that kind of drives you to certain activities, right? Which I think in a good way, like best times with PUBG, we have a very good relationships in terms of what are those deliverables, what makes sense for our community, mm. you know, uh, what are we going to do on Discord, you know, what kind of activities, you know, we even did some sort of like uh, uh, merchandise uh, partnership with PUBG as, as one of the rare teams in the world, right, so our kind of jerseys were on sale or mer like promoted on, 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 on PUBG in a game, right. Um, but exactly, like, you know, then the smaller, that's, that's a different when you kind of look into, like, which ones are the tier one opera, like organizations in esports and which are the rest. And I know it's tough for those tier two and tier three because that's where they want to go. And it's extremely tough. Um, but then it's just also the fact that uh, these tier one organizations are very easily stepping away, uh, moving on to another game title uh, if they don't get any, any, any support. Sometimes support ne doesn't need to be all financial, it can be other things, just that's kind of, you know, guaranteed visibility in their tournaments, you know, being able to play because that adds value to your partners. Now we can tell Red Bull that, hey, you know, we're going to play, you know, in this in this tournament next year. So that's that's automatically basically going to, you know, guarantee them certain level of visibility. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of different kind of variables on, on it, but financial incentive is very, very uh, important for esports teams. Yeah, yeah I, know, uh, I completely agree with that. I mean, we've seen that happen uh, with us, where we do have uh, some teams that we do support, and sometimes when they don't meet the end deliverables, um, unfortunately, things don't go the best way. Uh, but continued support from the developers uh, financially and on other things, I think it's very, very important. Uh, and at the same time, having a balance with these grassroots initiatives, because when the developers do support it, they, uh, this way you've, you've built out a properly structured ecosystem for that specific game. And at the same time, uh, from, a, from a gamer's side, right, they can turn this in from a hobby to a full profession mm. when they have full-out support. But to, you have to make sure there's a good partnership and uh, r uh, realistic deliverables uh, that the, these teams can meet uh, to get that support mm. uh, and not kind of over-exceed. So you have that continuous ongoing support, and it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, so it sounds like really if somebody wants to go from being an esports enthusiast, it's a shame we don't have Nick here because that would have been a really great little pun to have. But um, it, you know, if somebody wants to go from being an esports enthusiast to being an esports athlete, for lack of a better term, then you need the same kind of deal that you would have with you know like a professional footballer or like a professional football team where you have visibility and you're in the tournament, so that then when a sponsor comes to you, you don't just say, "Oh, well, we're really great at PUBG," and they're like, "Well." What's the benefit for us? And you can say, oh, we're going to be in this massive tournament with X number of people watching. They'll be like, yes, we're going to give you money. And I mean, Chris, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, I mean, professionally, I don't have so many touching points with that, but um, I totally agree to your point that this should follow more like the, the classical football route, right? So the cups are nice, you know, and these, uh, these big prize pots, but you have to have something like a league structure, like a whole economy, like they play league games, mm -hmm. you know, and then something needs to pay the date the day-to-day, -day, you know, the monthly uh, expenses they have and so on, so on. So the, the big cups are nice, but something has to lead up to that. And in a, in a football ecosystem, you have the, the club football, then you have Champions League, and then you have all the other cups going on. And I think this is eventually where, where it should go, where also like TV distribution rights are involved and sponsors, individual player sponsors and so on. 
I think it's getting there. I do believe League does something similar like that um, already with the League. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's still in, in in the cradle, I think. It's kind of it's kind of the, the 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 dream to be able to sell out your own stadium and everything while playing your esport of choice. Uh, well, it's it's in, uh, the one thing I kind of want to come. Uh, I'm going to have to put you back on the hook again, Chris, because again Please. you are sat nearest Please. to me, unfortunately. But um, one of the next questions that we're going on to is the discussion around collaborations between you know like um, co companies and esports organizations. Now you were for Dev Sisters, correct? Yes. Yeah. And obviously Dev Sisters, well known for the game Cookie Run, and some of you may know that they recently did, well, I say recently, this was a year or two ago now, the collaboration with uh, BTS, the right. famous K-pop band. Do we have any BTS fans in the audience? Very good. But one person over there, well, another person over there, fantastic. <laughs> that wasn't totally awkward, okay. But, you know, when we're talking about that, the uh, collab collaboration thing, mm -hmm. um, do you think that that's kind of a bit of a passing trend? You know, when we're talking about collaborations, we're talking about very different things to sponsorships, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you think collaborations are going to increasingly become a kind of thing? Because, you know, Mika, I think you were talking about the idea of having your the players on the teams kind of function as influencers. And I think a lot of them do. There's a lot of well-known esports personalities that have built themselves up as influencers. But do you think that it's going to increasingly become that they have collaborations in their role as an esports athlete? Or is that kind of more of a passing trend and we're kind of going to see that model shift back to just the regular influencers who are purely personality, maybe not purely skill, or both? Oh, I had you on the hook, Yeah, Chris. yeah, no problem. <laughs> well, no, we'll start with you, Chris. I can, I can take that briefly, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's actually an increasing trend. So imagine... Uh, in terms of marketing, it's pretty much a dream because you have a very clear-cut target audience that plays that particular game. And for collabs, you can find brands and sponsors, basically, that are very much interested in, in this particular group uh, of people. So I think um, it's a very nice way to target your audience and to, and I think I see that as a as a definitely an increasing trend uh, in the future going forward. Same for mobile. Uh, well, one hundred percent. I mean, it's it's a, it's an awesome way for these sponsors to. Uh, target to these uh, kind of gamers. Uh, so as a marketing perspective, it's a no-brainer, and it's just going to increase. And you'll have you know, all types of sponsors, from telecom companies to food delivery companies, sponsoring these events. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I'm gonna put it like, like I think uh, esports players and content creators are still underutilized mm -hmm. by many brands. I mean, it's kind of super easy to see the connection with an endemic brand like a, like a gaming gear manufacturer. We worked with Logitech for many years, so, you know, we actually had a, uh, uh, their launch event in our office just a few days ago, right, where, where local media came in to see their new product. Like, obviously, when a professional gamer mm -hmm. uh, is playing with their mouse, it makes com complete sense, similar to uh, Ronaldo using, you know, certain brand of, uh, of, of, of soccer shoes, right? Um, when it comes to non-dynamic, like when it's like, a, you know, somebody from financial industry or airline or like a, whatever, you know, FMCG brand, it's going to be more difficult. You need to be a lot more creative, right? I think what we've done with Red Bull and Red Bull has done that across different sports is that it's basically integrated to, to our daily operation, right? You know, I mean, how they started and how they usually start is they just, you know, bring the can. By the way, the can needs to always be open so it's more authentic, right? You know, in the pictures, right? When you're doing things right and you start creating content that they like, you know, you are going to expand the contract. You bring their uh, logo to the jersey, which, by the way, is always in the same place by the millimeter with all the teams, same color, all, and no exceptions, right? And then, obviously, you start creating more content, right? But, but it's a way for this kind of non-endemic that there's great examples, right? But there's a lot of like unknown. A lot of these people are interested in, uh, and particularly in, in in Middle East, there's so much hype around the esports right now. Um, but a lot of people just they just want to get in, but they don't necessarily know what to uh, what to expect and what to kind of what to kind of even ask for. Right? The times when people would jump in to just have a logo in a jersey, they've gone. Right? Like it's it was great to get that visibility on Twitch and those eyeballs. The amount can be insane, but. The real kind of 
kind of depth comes from the fact of what do you build around it, like how do you leverage that logo placement with activations and, you know, we do physical meet and greets in different events and then obviously we to deactivate our fan base on digital, you know, platforms like Twitter. Uh, TikTok is growing like crazy in esports, like across different fields as well, but, but like platforms like Discord where the super fans basically hang around, right? That's where we basically go and ask for their opinions, like sometimes, hey, you know, we want to we want to release a new jersey, right? A, B, C, D. It's a little bit like testing, you know, like asking their, I mean, these are the super fans, right? They care. Um, but as, as I, you know, going back to uh, what I said in, in the beginning, like it's, it's I think esports kind of, you know, athletes are still very underutilized by, by a lot of those brands, but comes to kind of collaborations and, you know, uh, cooperations. Yeah. All very interesting points. Um, the kind of thing that I want to come on to next, it's kind of what you've touched on there, especially with, you know, places like Mina where stuff is getting, uh, eSports specifically, is getting very, very popular. Um, but when we're talking in terms of investors, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the way they're approaching. I think we, um, we've spoken about this kind of one-on-one, -on -one, some of us, mm -hmm. is the <laughs> idea of how investors are kind of approaching eSports. You know, a lot of them are coming at it there's, there's always a discussion of esports in relationship to traditional sports. You know, people are saying, oh, well, these esports athletes are like a footballer, but they're not really. You know, people are, the investors are especially approaching with the assumption that it's going to be like a football team, sold out stadium shows, you know, massive sponsorships and stuff like that. And you mentioned, Mika, the, the, the idea that there's a bit of an esports winter at the moment. Do you think that the way that investors have approached in the past with that hope? Is sustainable? Do you think that they're kind of stepping back because they've realized it's not what, quite what they imagined? They, they, they are already stepping back. So I, I, I know quite a lot of our friends, you know, out, out there in the big world uh, who are uh, basically uh, downscaling and, and not making the investments they used to. Um, and, and that's just because of the fact that they couldn't find a model or business models that would be eventually scaling enough that you build a sustainable business, right? And, 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 and part of that is that, uh, particularly in North America, many of the investors came in like shouting and fighting for their chances to invest, yet they were expecting also, let's say, uh, they were expecting to have an exit market like in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a tech companies or games companies, by the way, right? Like you have except ex expect an exit market, you expect like uh, huge multipliers, right? And it's not happening in esports, it's completely different. So when, when we talk to investors, and by the way, we don't have investors, so we bootstrap, but when we talk to investors, I think family offices are probably, uh, you know, our, our kind of, you know, uh, they, they seem more, interested in about the longer term sustainability and success, not necessarily securing their funds, making an exit which is not going to be 20x in three years rather than making, you know, some nice exit in, you know, whether that's 10 or 15 years, much more time and much more kind of patience. But there has been a lot of these kind of investors coming into esports, particularly in states because of like all these streamers, you know, you have you know, streamers are millions of people are watching and, and, and it's simply the eyeballs, right? But then there has been a missing formula for like sustainability of like monetization perspective, right? And that's been kind of, it's a typical that people coming shouting like in waves and then, you know, they realize like hey, it doesn't work like that, then it all goes south, right? And now I know a lot of great teams who are struggling because they can't find an investor, although they may have a lot better vision and idea of how they want to monetize later on. So it's, uh, that we're kind of, I hope we're kind of, you know, in that, like, uh, like we're at the worst place right now as, right. A, as, a, as an industry in terms of being investable. So hopefully it's going to get better in, uh, in yeah. so because again, like eyeballs of like the, the audience is growing, you know, a lot of gamers are growing, there's more tiles coming. And so that, like all the great metrics are there, but it's just like, I think the expectation were, were like insanely high and not justified, so then you gotta take a step back as an investor and you know, yeah. take a breathe and then tomorrow you kind of rethink, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that actually connects again to what I was gonna come back to you about, Chris, because I think we, we were discussing kind of like the, uh, specifically, um, obviously I've just brought up at Gamers 8, so we can't talk, not talk about the elephant in the room, which is, you know, guys like Savvy Games Group who are putting major money in. Do you think that with other investors stepping back that these really big businesses are going to kind of monopolize a little bit on the esports thing because you know they're willing to put in a lot of money 
whereas other people just aren't or can't or won't. Yeah, it's, I, I can see that trend. I'm not so scared, though. I'm actually pretty glad they're doing it. And uh, again, like to pick up on what you said, it's a bit of a long shot, right? Mm. So your, your numbers are growing. Um, the, the, the esports is growing as a whole. It's just, it's just a matter of when it will be profitable, right? And if you're able and willing to invest early on, um, I hope that this will also function as a role model and other people will jump on that train again and ultimately they improve the quality of esports consumably uh, and also for the players um, a lot, I think, and I really hope that that, that trend keeps going. Monopoly is never really cool, um, I yep. would say, so I hope that uh, other people will see and, and bigger companies will also see the benefit and the, 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 the perspective it has. Um, I'm pretty sure it'll come um, and there will be other interested parties, it's just a matter of when it is. Okay, and yeah, you like and to I, th I think it's a matter of also where I mean, like uh, you've probably seen uh, uh, the markets plays a huge role. Like in the Middle East, we've actually seen it uh, grow at such a rapid pace, and we've seen money flowing. Uh, I mean, in the Senate from the side of the esports group, which is crazy, uh, and we've also seen investments in the esports world at such a massive pace. Um, we're, we're currently in talks with the Saudi government, the UAE, and the Iraqi government. And they're all uh, you know, crazy numbers of investments in the esports and just to host these mm. esports tournaments. And, and I think it'll, it'll grow more. Um, just, you know, as you said, uh, profitability, sustainability long term is going to be key. Uh, but also, f knowing where to go is also another important thing. Um, mm. Fantastic. I almost don't want to. I almost don't want to stop you guys, but we are slowly coming in on our time, and I did want to have some time for questions. If people wanted to do that, if we are taking questions, sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we've got already got one taker over there. Fantastic. Um, going back to the discussion about the mobile esports, like the earlier ones. Um, so, what if the hypothetical scenario that there's a true cross-platform live game where players can play through console controllers, PC, and mobile at the same time? In this hypothetical scenario, what would esports spectatorship would look like in the future? I think you've stumped them already. Uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's 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 a good one. Um, I, I I I think from my perspective, I I I think I would see that positively. I think uh, I think kind of that would that would open up a whole lot of new avenues. You know, from the business perspective, obviously. Um, trying to put myself into the shoes of some of some of the uh, professional players, they might see more concerns, <coughs> right? Uh, you know, I'm playing with my PC in like Finland. You know, like, am I in threat of somebody from uh, I don't know uh, Vietnam? You know, taking my space, playing with mobile because you know, being much more, you know, uh, also like, you know less costly as, an, as, a, as a player, right, you know? But I think I, I see that as positive, and I, I know they're like, obviously our players who are playing uh, top of the world, they play many other games. As anybody who's playing games, you know, you always have various different games on your mobile or in your console or in PC, right? They spend a lot of time on playing casual games, right? And I see them sometimes playing games where they're, you know, after their practice, they, they might start something with their PC and then they move on to uh, mobile when they, uh, you know, take a shuttle to the hotel or whatever. So there's already that happening, right? But, but really to push that to a uh, really competitive scene, um, I think that's going to be still uh, quite, uh, you know, far down the road, to be honest. Well, to, to add to that, I think that would be amazing. That would be great. But just me thinking about it for, for a brief moment, I, for some reason, always think about shooters and then imagine it really competitively, esports. So me on my mobile and then some people on, on the PC and console, there will be at the end some sort of discussion if it was a level play field, if somebody has an advantage, right? Or better reaction time, even though we, we crossed that technical hurdle. So I'm pretty sure if it's for prize money, there'll be arguments like, oh, yeah, well, he's playing on a mouse or something like that, right? So I see that coming. But in general, that would be amazing. Yeah, I, I think we, all, we, we do already see that kind of debate with, especially you brought up shooters, you know. 
uh, controller versus mouse. That's still a major debate about which is which is better, which has the advantage. I think a lot of people would probably say mouse. Um, Tamara, did you want to add anything on? No, I think the guys got it, and you know, uh, with 5G roll, being rolled out globally, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, that in terms of latency, that would solve a huge. Uh, uh, it's solve any issues in terms of playing mobile versus PC, but in terms of controls, I think some would uh, say the mouse has a big advantage compared to your finger. Fingers moving, but again, that's just my two cents. Okay. Um, yeah, we are running running a little low on time. Can we do one more? One more question. One more question. Anybody? Any any takers? Fantastic. Oh, hello. So my question is also somewhat about the mobile esports, but I think about days back when we have like net cafes and they of course like went extinct at one point, but now we are seeing like game rooms rising like all over the world and I think there are quite few in Finland also. And children nowadays they are basically born with like mobile phones on their hands. So the new generations are more like mobile gamers. So are we going to see some kind of like change in that uh, even like those are gaming with PCs, with like esports in like bigger teams or something that they are like more common to have a game room somewhere like public game rooms or something like that. Do you think that it's going to be like more sustainable thing to build up a gaming room? I, 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 I'd love if that happens. I think like we, 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 are, we are trying to kind of maybe take a little bit more role in terms of the whole society as well, particularly in our, our home market, meaning that uh, we kind of try to work a little bit more with like uh, educational, you know, like schools, etc. But I think one of the areas is that we are also trying to see what we can do to get kids out of their bedroom playing games and whether that's the PC or, or mobile it's kind of the same same challenge because on the other hand if you look at the competitive side like the best players we have are typically well, the player who's had like a team sport background is a lot better typically to start off than somebody who's playing alone in his bedroom mechanical skills might be the same but mechanical skills are like what 20 30 percent of the of the of the of the of the performance because it's all about community it's about communication all, all of that stuff right so and and then it comes to the need as well right um, I recently went to team vitality's office one of our friends in in, in in France in Paris they have this office where they have a game room as well or, or coffee um, um, uh, game coffee whatever one of the needs that the local market has is that, uh, and I didn't know that, but a lot of the apartments obviously are very small in Paris, right? So kids go after school to Vitality's office to play PC games because they don't have space for, for proper desktops in their own bedrooms, right? So that's kind of based on a need that, hey, you know, somebody figured it out. And a lot of these kids have like a monthly passes, they go. And then obviously it's about community. They hang around with friends, et cetera. So I think that's important that, you know, but how to lure people who love mobile games to a location, like you need to offer something more because they don't basically need to go there. That's, a, that's an important question, but, uh, but we'd love to do something around that area if we can. Yeah, uh, I'm just, do we have a few seconds for them to add on their thoughts? Yep, fantastic, sorry. So, I think I don't have anything to add to that, to be honest. That was a beautiful... Yeah, timer. neither do I. You're in. Oh, thank oh. God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, because the, ti the, the timer is going off. So, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And can we get a round of applause for our three amazing panelists?